Sinner United Methodist Church, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on a beautiful fall morning. Got a few announcements to draw your attention to this morning. Uh, things that you will find in your bulletin. Coming up next Sunday is our homecoming. Uh, we will just have one service at 11 o'clock, the inside service, and that will be followed by a potluck lunch. Uh, if weather is nice, we'll be having that outside. If not, we'll be spreading out inside and trying not to sneeze on each other. Uh, but please bring a dish to share. November 23rd, that is the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, we will be having our Thanksgiving service here uh, with White Hill and possibly with Ephesus. I haven't heard back from them yet. Uh, so that's going to be at 7 o'clock on the 23rd. And then on the 25th, uh, we are hosting a Thanksgiving dinner for any of our, our church and community members who are um, in need of a place to eat and people to eat with. Lisa, what time is that and what do you need folks to know about that? All right, that will be from 11.30 to 3. And um, anybody who wants to come, let me know. Let me know what you want to bring and share to eat, and we'll get that all together. And also on November 7th, we have family promise, and we need meals for both Monday and Saturday for family At this point, we just have one woman and two kids, but there's another family that's been approved, but they haven't moved in yet, so hopefully by then they will. What? All right, are there any other announcements? Anything I've missed? Life person of the year will be known at home center. All right. Anything else? What are you doing in the this So we can put in what we need to do. Uh, usually have it done by Thursday. Then you can let you know the Wednesday. Thank you very much. Anything else? <laughs> All right, well, Ralph is going to open us with a call to worship, and as he does so, let us quiet our minds and our hearts and center ourselves on Christ. <laughs>
please turn to number 858. Our Psalter this morning is Psalm 146. We pray this responsibly. I will leave with a regular print as we will respond together with both. Psalm 146, number 858. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have been. Put not your trust in princes and mortals in whom there is no help. But their bread is so hard, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is in the God of Jacob. Who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them? The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. And the souls of the living. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, from generation to generation. Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. What are you thankful for this morning? What joys are happening in your life? Amen. All right. Good. I'm glad she's doing all right. Glad that everything went well. I had surgery on Tuesday. It was 16 hours worth of surgery. Mm -hmm. They totally removed the whole one side of the space um, and put it back together with pieces of steam. The good news is they got all cancer. Good. It's yes. just a long recovery. Yeah, that's, that's quite an extensive surgery. Yeah, even they kind of crazy a little bit. Also, something that Jill has moved back to an apartment. Absolutely. Absolutely. For, for those who might not have heard yet, Jill with us, I uh, got some good news. She's been in a facility and, and not a great place, and it's not able to move into an assisted living apartment of her home. And I believe that we are collecting some things to help her out in her move and to help her get started. Um, I believe Kathy might be the one that's organizing that. Any other thanks, Thanksgiving this morning? Thanks for my new friends, Robert and Carolyn. Um, so, <laughs> I, I feel like you don't get new friends very often because you know everybody already. <laughs> this is a milestone. This is my new friend. <laughs> what needs our prayers this week? Our neighbor in Virginia, Martha, her mother turned 90 yesterday. Mm -hmm. Goldie, full week, and she's having some heart issues. Okay. They asked her to pray for her. Anything else? We have a niece. Um, her name is Amy Parkinson. She has just recently been diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. and had surgery for me. So, okay. anything else? All right, let's go before the Lord in prayer. As always, I encourage you to pray along with me and during times of silence, lift loud any names that are on your hearts. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you so much for this beautiful ending to October. Thank you for bringing us together through this month. Thank you for giving us the air that we breathe, the light that shines into our world. Thank you for all the good that has brought us to this point, all the good that we find on our table. Lord, you have repeatedly laid a banquet of blessings before us to the point that we take it for granted and neglect to say thank you. So as we enter into this time of worship, open our eyes to see all the blessings that are around us. And let us come before you with thanks on our lips. Because you didn't have to give us any of these things. 
Lord, we were dead in our sins, and yet you chose to bring life, to bring salvation and redemption to us. We give you thanks for that, even as we confess our continued sins. Acknowledging that we daily rebel against you, that we daily neglect your love, that we daily neglect our neighbors. We confess that we have called evil things good, and we have pointed accusingly out the sins of others and justified our own. We ask that you will forgive us for our sins, that your light will shine into our lives, that our repentance may be real and true, that we may rise up and sin no more. By your grace, carry us forth from here to, spread, to proclaim your grace to all, to be ministers of your gospel, to be missionaries into this world, this world that needs love and hope, this world that needs you. We pray for the ministries of this church. We pray for the ministries of all your churches everywhere. Though we may all work together hand in hand for your glory, your benefit, and your kingdom. Lord, we pray for your people, for those who are called by name, for those who don't even know you yet. We pray that your people will know you will love you this day, no matter how they are gathered. We pray for those who are hurting. We ask that you would heal the sick, the physically ill, those who are undergoing treatments, those who are facing surgeries, those who are in recovery, those who are totally not recovered. We pray for the mentally ill, those who suffer in ways that are not easily seen or diagnosed, the depressed and the anxious and the schizophrenic, the bipolar and the borderline. And so many. We pray for the broken heart. Those who are grieving and filled with sorrow, those who are alone and isolated, those who feel alone, even when surrounded by others. We ask that you would heal bodies, minds, and hearts. We ask that you would heal our relationships with one another. Teach us to give forgiveness as you do. Humble us to ask for forgiveness. Heal our homes and families, heal our friendships, heal our church and our community. Heal our state, our nation, and our world. For all who are in need of healing, for all who are in need of mercy this day, we pray. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you that you are great enough to answer our prayers. Even when the answers are not the ones that we want, we know that they are the ones that we need. Because when all that you do is good. Thank you for shining your goodness into our lives. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to live and die and rise again for our sake. We praise you for all of these things. We join our voices together with the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. I was thinking this morning uh, that we as a church we were never at our best here on Sunday mornings, which is funny because we're always we're told we're your best on Sunday mornings. We're at our best when we're out there doing things for others. And, this morning, as I thought about Jill and, and her uh, finally, after a long time of uh, being able to move, I uh, think of all the support that she has gotten from this church and how we, we've rallied around her in recent months and, and been there. Now, that's what we're called to do. That is following Christ. That is loving as Christ loves. And it takes all of us working together. It takes a community to do that. I say this every week when we take up the tithes and the offerings. It's not to keep the lights on. It's not to keep the pastor, uh, pastor paid. It's to give to the mission of this church. To give not just of our finances, but of our time. Even something as simple as taking a, a few paper towels up to Jill, whatever it is. This is the church. Not in the worship, but in the service. We serve in order to worship, and we worship in order to serve. 
So I ask our ushers to come forward at this time as they do. I ask that you all be a part of this mission, be a part of what God is doing in this place, building up God's kingdom, giving your tithes, giving your offerings, giving your time and your energy and your spirit.
Then the scribes said to him, You're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that, he answered wisely. He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any questions. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are here among us. You inhabit the praises of your people. You inhabit your word. Now inhabit our hearts that we may live changed lives. And through our lives, you may inhabit the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. My kids don't listen to me. You may ever have that problem before. My kids don't listen to me. I know it's going to get worse before it gets better. But when I say my kids don't listen to me at this point, at least, I don't just mean that they don't take my advice. I mean that there are times when my kids literally do not hear the words I am saying. I mean, just it's, it's like talking to very noisy brick walls sometimes. And there are, are two occasions, especially, that my kids will absolutely not hear my voice. The first is when they're distracted by something like TV. Now, I was the same way as a kid, but it's amazing to watch my kids sit down in front of that glowing screen with all of its colors. We're really into My Little Pony right now. My Little Pony has all kinds of bright colors, and they sing happy songs, and my kids just sit there with this expression of just complete emptiness on their face. And I could fall down the stairs. I could be lying at death's door at the bottom of my stairs yelling for help. And my kids would have no idea until they came looking for me, wondering why I haven't made them a snack yet. <laughs> that TV comes on and they just get so engrossed in it. I can say anything to them. They're not going to hear. The other scenario where my kids don't hear anything I'm saying is when there's something else on their mind, usually something upsetting. They've been told to do something that they don't want to do. Take a bath, go to bed, do your homework. Or one of them has done something to the other that she feels is unfair. You know, they took my toy or you said a mean thing about me. And they come to me with much weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And they're so caught up in whatever it is that they're crying or their argument, or, or trying to express whatever is on their mind. They're, they're caught up in this thing. They're caught up in the stream of consciousness that it does not matter what I say. They don't hear me. And sometimes it's because they're crying too loud, but most of the time it's just because they're so focused on themselves. They're so focused on getting their own words or wails and in either of these scenarios, I have four uh, basic strategies for dealing with, for, for making sure that my kids actually do hear me. The first is to raise my own voice. Now, I don't like to do that. I don't like to yell. But sometimes it is necessary to literally be heard over all the other cacophony of noises that are going on in my house. Sometimes I have to raise my voice. Other times, especially when they're just on some sort of a, a rant about something, I like to just throw out something bizarre to catch their attention. I'll speak to them in another language. Or I'll just start saying them just the most random things. They're telling me all this, hey, this happened, this happened, this happened today, ice cream, flying turtles went to the moon yesterday. This random thing is so bizarre, so strange that it clicks on something in the brain. What in the world is that talking about? Sometimes that works. Other times, I will just simply hush. Just close my mouth. Now, this is a strategy that takes the longest. And I mean, it takes a long time. But when my kids are just going off about something, they're not going to hear my voice, I would sometimes just sit there and wait. Because if I stay silent long enough, eventually they will either run out of breath or two, realize, wait a minute, that hasn't said anything in the last 45 minutes. Is he alive still? 
The final strategy that I use is to take something away. If they're watching TV and they can't hear me, then the TV goes on. If they're fighting over a toy or a stuffed animal or something like that, that toy or that stuffed animal goes away. This week I threatened to throw away ice cream. Thankfully, I did not have to throw away the ice cream. Or sometimes what I have to do is actually remove the child. Sometimes I have to physically pick up one of the kids and take her somewhere else, upstairs to a room, outside on the porch, even just into the living room or into the kitchen, just somewhere, some kind of change of scenery. Sometimes what it takes to finally get them to settle down and listen. And all of this is done for one reason and one reason only. I love my children and I want to speak to them. I want them to hear my voice. I want them to know what it is that I want them to know. Now, today's passage is a very familiar one to any of us who have spent time in a church. It's a very familiar story. We've got Mark's account here, but it comes up in Matthew, it comes up in Luke. Same scenario. Jesus is teaching a uh, scribe, someone who knows the scriptures, comes up and asks him this question. Jesus, what's the best commandment? Jesus says, oh, the best is you love God, love your heart, soul, mind, strength. Second one, love your neighbor as yourself. We've heard this. We've read this before. I've preached on this before. It's something that we're very familiar with, and therein lies the problem. Because familiarity breeds inattentiveness. And familiarity breeds apathy. Familiarity sometimes requires some sort of a change to shake it up and get our attention. That's why I decided to quote some Hebrew this morning. See, every time I preach and teach about this story, I'm always quick to tell folks, look, Jesus did not make this up on the spot. Jesus is actually quoting from the Old Testament. That first one about loving God, that's from Deuteronomy. The second one about loving your neighbor, that's from Leviticus. Jesus' native language would have been Aramaic. That's what he would have grown up speaking. That's what he probably spoke uh, in the actual setting when he was discussing it with the scribes. Matthew, Mark, Luke, these guys, they wrote in Greek. But the scriptures that Jesus had have been in Hebrew. And so if he is quoting Hebrew, there's a very good chance that he would have quoted it in Hebrew. And so that first <coughs> commandment that he gives translates into English, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That second commandment he quotes is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus does an amazing thing because he's asked, what is the first commandment? And right here, right away, we need to pay attention to what Mark does because we're used to thinking, okay, what's the greatest commandment? But no, he's actually asked, what is the first commandment? In other words, what's the first thing that I need to do? If I am obeying God, if I am doing what God wants, what's the very first thing I have to do? And instead of telling one commandment, Jesus tells two. First things first. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God, the Lord of hearts, soul, mind, and strength. Second, you must love your neighbor as yourself. You want to obey God? Start with these. Keep on. This is where we go. This is how we follow God. Now, under a typical sermon, I will spend most of my time talking about those things, talking about what does it mean to love God? What does it mean to love our neighbor? But today, I want to point out exactly what it is that Jesus said in this commandment. Because Mark <laughs> records it differently than Matthew and Luke. Mark includes the entire quote from Deuteronomy, not just the part about love. And that's important because if we understand the point that Jesus is making here, the first commandment does not begin with love. The first commandment begins with the word here. That's a very well-known commandment in Jewish culture and tradition. It's actually called the Shema. Shema being the Hebrew word for here. And that is how the commandment begins. Shema Yisrael Adonai Here, O Israel. 
This is important because our faith is not one that comes from building ourselves up to God. Our faith comes from hearing from God. God is speaking faith into our lives. God is speaking love into our lives. And so if we are to love God, and if we are to love our neighbor, then we must hear God speaking to us. But we're very, very bad at that. I worry that the church does not hear from God anymore. The church, by and large, is failing. Right now, our numbers are dwindling, our ministries are dwindling. We are failing because we aren't listening to God. And the reasons for that are simple. They're the exact same reasons why my kids don't hear my voice. We're distracted by other things that we're looking at, flashy things, shiny things, loud things. And we're caught up with our own voices, our own concerns, our own thoughts and stream of conscious and opinions. We become wrapped up in our ideas of what God ought to be like, what church ought to be like, what God ought to be doing, what this world ought to look like. But we don't actually hear the truth that God is saying to us. Consider this. The word catechesis is one that does not get thrown around very much in the Methodist church. Catechesis basically means church teaching. Now, there are a lot of traditions. We have our Reformed Catholic over here, who's probably been familiar with uh, catechesis. A lot of traditions have used catechesis for centuries, if not millennia now, to teach people how to be a Christian. It's a simple thing. I mean, you're told, okay, I'm going to ask you a question. This is how you answer it. Who is God? Who is the Father? Who is the Son? Who is the Holy Spirit? What is the church? What do we do in church? Etc. Simple church teaching. However, today, catechesis has really gone out the window. Church teaching is not prioritized in our lives, which is strange because we have more opportunities to learn than we ever have before. You come here on Sunday mornings, you hear me preach, that's catechesis, that's me teaching. You go to Sunday school, that's more church teaching. You come to Bible study on Thursday morning, that's more. Or you tune in online. Can't be there for the live at 9 o'clock. It's recorded. You can watch it later. Don't want to come to this one? There's literally hundreds of churches around us. Most of them have some sort of Bible study. You can go there. You can watch them online. You can watch them from all over the world or online. You don't want to watch it online? You can listen to it on the radio. You can buy books, thousands of books of church teaching. You don't even have to go to a bookstore. You can order them, have them delivered to your house. You don't even need to have them delivered. You have them downloaded to your phone. Don't want to do that? You can listen to a podcast. Don't want to do that? You can have an email to you every morning. You can wake up and do a little devotion waiting for you every morning. Don't want to do that? You can have it on your phone and do a little ping, here's your verse of the day, time to pray. We have so many opportunities to learn from Scripture, to learn from God, to learn from the church, but most of us don't do that. The majority, the vast majority, of church teaching that happens. Let me change that. A vast majority of church teaching that's received, and you see it right here in the sermon, week in, week out. Most of my sermons last about 15 minutes, sometimes around 20 minutes. So most church members get 15 to 20 minutes of church teaching a week. Well, that's if they decide to come every week, maybe every other week, maybe once a month. So let's just say 20 minutes. 20 minutes every week, you're getting good at church teaching. How many of y'all have watched more than 20 minutes of TV this past week? Anybody listen to the radio for more than 20 minutes this week? Spend more than 20 minutes online, on Facebook, YouTube? How many of you just watch more than 20 minutes of news this week? Or listen to it? See, I think this is why we aren't hearing from God. We give God 20 minutes a week to speak to us. The rest of the time, we're getting inundated with everything else. We give preference to things that are more flashy than God, things that might seem more exciting than God. We give our preference, we give our attention to 
politics, and news, sports, vacation, recreation, hobbies. You know what we really like to give our attention to? Our own opinions. Ooh, I love my opinion. It's great. Because my opinion never disagrees with you. Consider this. I and every pastor that I know can tell you names of people who have left a church, whether it's their own church that they're currently pastoring or another one. They know, can tell you names of people who have left a church because that church disagreed with a political party. I don't know any that have left a political party because they disagreed with the church. Makes you wonder where our allegiance is. Makes you wonder who's shaping our faith and our worldview. We also know this as pastors the quickest way to be let go from a church is to say something they all disagree with. Whether it's right isn't what matters. If y'all disagree with it, say it enough time, don't run a set of family. Every pastor I know lives and works with that fear of what am I going to say this time that I know is right, but is going to anger the wrong people. <clears throat> we don't actually love God. We don't love God because we don't actually know God. And we don't know God because we can't hear God. And we can't hear God because we're just too distracted to give God that sort of attention. Instead, we know a false God, a God that is made in our image, a God that agrees with us, a God that likes the things that we like, that likes our hobbies, a God that even likes our sports team. We all know God is a little pack fan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, we love a false God that we've made. We don't love the actual God. I think God is trying to make us hear him in much the same way that I try to get my kids' attention. I think that God has raised his voice, but we didn't listen. I think that God has thrown some really bizarre stuff our way, but we didn't listen. I think that God has been silent. And now God has started taking things away from us. I have to wonder, what's God going to take away next? How much will God have to take away before we actually hush and listen? God does these things because he loves us. That's the good news. God's not willing to surrender us to this world. In spite of our willing deafness, in spite of our distraction, in spite of our apathy, in spite of our selfishness, in spite of our sin, our idolatry. God loves us. And God wants us to love him. And God knew that we could not love him, so God made a way for us to love him. Without the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we could not love God. But now, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can love perfectly. We can love as Christ loves. We can love with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We can love our neighbor as ourselves. But first, we need to hear. God wants us to love. He wants us to love him. He wants us to love our neighbor. I think that if we ever actually start listening to God, that's exactly what we hear God say. Let's pray. Father, forgive us for not loving you. Forgive us for preferring the false gods that we have made in our own image. Forgive us for living in our own echo chambers, surrounded only by things that make us feel comfortable. Open our ears that we may hear you, and through hearing you, we may love you. And love you and love you. Name Jesus Christ. Let's prepare ourselves for the week by singing together our final hymn number 384.
Love divine, all loves accept you. You may stand as you are comfortable, and as always, our altar rail is open for those. Number 384. <laughs> Thank you. 